Knowing how Christ saved us, how should Christians act towards each other and the world? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse study of the book of Romans on Walking Through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, in spite of this, God has manifested his love for us in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Having expressed such a great love towards us, all of mankind can be saved simply if we come to faith in Christ, a faith that obeys what God has said. No, by obeying God, one does not earn their salvation. But our faith is dead without obedience. Abraham's faith is a faith that obeyed what God said, giving us an example to follow. If God said, believe in Jesus, we need to believe in Jesus. If God said, repent of our sins, we need to repent of our sins. If God said, be baptized for the remission of sins, then we need to be baptized for the remission of sins. It's that simple. For that's what a faithful person would do. An unfaithful person, on the other hand, would expect God to do everything for us, believing he has commanded us simply to believe in Jesus when the scriptures clearly say otherwise. We need to have the faith of Abraham, who, when told by God to leave his country and go to a land that God would show him, Abraham went. Who, when told to circumcise his flesh and those of his descendants, Abraham did so. Who, when told to offer Isaac the seed of promise as a sacrifice to God, Abraham obeyed, though God stopped him from offering Isaac in the end. None of these works by themselves save Abraham. Abraham had to have faith in God first. But as James 2 will teach us, without those works, Abraham's faith would have been dead and he would not have been saved. In the book of Romans, most of the time, Paul has been speaking of the works of the law of Moses when discussing works, showing Jews that Gentiles didn't need to become Jews and that law-keeping on its own couldn't save you because you sinned against the law and therefore needs God's grace in order to receive the forgiveness of your sins. And to receive this grace, you needed to have faith in Christ. But nowhere in Paul's argument was he saying that obedience wasn't a part of faith. It is integral to faith. Simply doing work, simply doing the outward, if it is not accompanied by faith from the heart, is not pleasing to God, for God desires that we worship him in spirit and in truth. He requires both, and grace will only be received if one possesses that faith that obeys. In the last lesson, we learned that as a response to this outpouring of love, We're to present our bodies as living sacrifices, fulfilling our role in the church, which involves serving one another as well as serving God. Coming now to verse 9, Paul tells Christians to let our love be without hypocrisy. What Paul is meaning here is that our love towards others, whether they be Christians or non-Christians, needs to be more than mere words. It must be backed up with action. It's very easy to say that you love someone, but do your actions say otherwise? 
Are you never able to assist someone in need, whether that's physical, spiritual, or financial, even though you have the ability to do so? Are you never willing to teach others the gospel using what talents God has given you? Then how can you say you love others? Words are just that. The truthfulness of them are borne out in what we do. Christians also are to abhor evil and cling to that which is good. This is a personal command. If we abhor evil, that means we are to recognize what evil is, what it does in enslaving us in sin, and to actually hate it so much that we no longer desire to live in it. And we accomplish that by clinging to that which is good, that which God says is good. We only sin when we fail to do that which God says we're to do. There is never any sin in doing God's will, for that's always right. Growing in this is a process, though, and even though we won't get to a point where we'll never sin, we need to grow so that we sin less and less because we're growing ever closer to God. Towards our brethren, we're to be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. When it comes to fellow Christians, we're to be a close-knit family. Yes, we're to show love to everyone, but we are to actually be close with our brethren as if they were our physical family. That means that we will sacrifice for them, help those who are needy, be hospitable one towards another, not seeking to gain priority over them. But won't this lead to some Christians taking advantage of others? No, for this is a two-way street. Christians who are obeying God here won't take advantage of others. They won't play poor and helpless when they are not. They won't use other Christians and waste their time. And they will help others less fortunate than themselves, too, when given the opportunity. When we put others above ourselves, we're seeking their good, their safety, and we'll be sacrificing some of our own desires and our opinions for their well-being. I fear that this is sometimes lacking in Christians today as we're living in a highly individualistic society. But that's part of what it means not to be conformed to this world. God demands that we be better. We're not to be lagging in diligence in serving the Lord, but fervent in spirit, rejoicing in the hope that we have in Christ, which is able to allow us to be patient, to endure through tribulation, remembering that we can always approach God in prayer for strength and guidance. When it comes to our attitude towards the world, we're to bless those who persecute us and not curse them. For many, this is a hard thing to put into practice, for it's very easy to curse those who do harm to us. We see this all the time on television and movies through the use of expletives. Christians aren't to behave this way. We're to remember that vengeance is not ours, it is the Lord's. He will repay, a reference to Deuteronomy 32:35. How and when God will repay, we're to leave up to God. But we're not to take revenge out on anyone, no matter what they have done. Can I seek out justice through law enforcement? Yes, for we'll see that that's their job, according to chapter 13. Seeking justice, though, is not the same as exacting personal vengeance. For justice requires evidence and a fair arbiter who will render a just judgment, while vengeance is about us seeking to act out on our own anger and hate. What are we to do if our enemy hungers? We're to feed them. If they're thirsty, we're to give them drink. In acting kindly towards them, hopefully it will wound their conscience enough for them to stop acting out in an evil way towards us and actually change their ways, with this being the meaning of heaping coals of fire on their head. This command is a reference to Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. What if they don't? Vengeance is God. He will repay in the end. For us, we're to try our hardest to live peaceably with all men, meaning we're not to seek out confrontation and we're not to be rebellious. Yes, we must stand for truth, but not every disagreement is about the truth of God's word. Some is personal opinion, which Paul says we're not to be wise in. Yes, we may have knowledge in some areas, and yes, we may have opinions, but we need to also be able to take instruction from others and be able to change those opinions when they need changing. Never compromise on truth, but be humble in our own opinions. In all of this, then, we are not to set our mind on high things, the things of this world like money and power, but associate with the humble. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're to weep with those who weep. And as Christians, we're to be united with one another, having God's word as our unifying standard. That's what salvation by faith in Christ causes us to do. It causes us to become slaves of righteousness 
to renew our minds and to act towards one another in a way that brings glory to God and that which befits those who wear the name of Christ. That is a high standard indeed, but let's all strive to grow in it. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his cross.